me. Ah, good. Thank you. Uh, good morning. A warm welcome to uh, all of you uh, and to our panelists on uh, stage. Uh, this session is called How Can India Plan for Resilient Growth While Ensuring Equity and Sustainability? Uh, it's more of a uh, discussion, conversational format. Uh, this session is partnership between the World Economic Forum and uh, Time. I am Zuhair Abdul Karim. Uh, I am the Asia editor of Time. Um, the India growth story has so far basically focused on numbers, um, GDP growth figures, FDI, stock indices. But often these numbers mask, um, do not give it sufficient s attention and mask problems that are happening elsewhere in the country. The issue is how can we create prosperity that is sustained as well as sustainable and much more inclusive? In short, how can we create a kinder and gentler India? These are the questions that we will be uh, addressing this morning. And we have a terrific uh, group of people, very, very su a super smart group. Uh, to my immediate right is Ajay Chibber, who is the Assistant Secretary General of the UN and Director Asia and Pacific for the United Nations Development Program. Um, in alphabetical order, we have Arish Handi, Managing Director of Selco Solar Light. He's a social entrepreneur based in Bangalore. Then we have Arvind Mayaram, Secretary, Department of Economic Affairs, uh, the Ministry of Finance, and one of the key movers uh, behind uh, the reforms that we've seen kick-started again very recently. We have Zia Modi, who is Managing Partner of AZB and partners. Uh, she needs no introduction. Uh, one of India's most prominent uh, corporate lawyers. And then we have David Tomlinson, who is global head, geographic uh, strategy and operations for Accenture. Again, a company that needs no uh, um, uh, introduction. Um, I want to uh, bring up three things first that I would like our panel and all of you in the audience, because we will try to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, I will make some opening remarks, then we will go to each panelist, and each panelist should feel free to interject at any time. Uh, we really want to make this uh, a conversation. I mean, you know, we'll keep it civilized. You know, no one, we, we won't come to blows. Uh, uh, but we would like to make this as, as conversational, as free-flowing uh, as possible. Recently in the FT, Mohammed L. Ariane of PIMCO and Nobel laureate Michael Spence wrote that India is yet to move beyond first generation structural reforms, namely state managed controls to more market based ones. Basically what they're saying much more elegantly but is, is that basically India has done the easy stuff. You know, they've picked a low hanging fruit. So the question is that where does India go from here? In in Time Magazine, uh, in the issue that is available outside, Rethinking India, uh, Akash Kapoor, who, who is an Indian author who wrote the book India Becoming, wrote in the issue that India is an, at an inflection point, that it's grasping for a new model. People are losing optimism. They're looking for growth with justice. He's seeking a new idea of India, although it is hard to articulate what that idea will be, and maybe we will actually get some ideas today. So that's the second point that I would like to, our panelists to keep in mind to inform their remarks uh, uh, this morning, as well as you in the audience. Recently, I was at an Asia Society conference in Hong Kong, and this is actually not to do with the elephant in the room, but with the dragon in the room. The conference was on China, and it was about China's 12-5-year plan, which is how they want to reorient the economy away from fixed investment, fixed capital investment, infrastructure, and so on, exports to a much more consumer-based society. And someone in the audience asked that if you have 1.4 billion people spending like crazy, what, does, what is that actually going to do? You know, the environmental degradation, the loss of values, the materialism. And someone in the panel who is an advisor to the Hong Kong government, a pro-China gentleman, said, well, that will be the end of the world. 
Now that's, that's apocalyptic hyperbole, but it is something that I would also like our panel to keep in mind as we talk about growth beyond numbers, which is the theme of this session. I want to turn first to, to Ajay Chibber, because I, Ajay, of course, uh, in his capacity and in his years with, with the World Bank and the UN, has seen a lot. He has seen development models everywhere. And I think that he can, he'll be able to draw on his own experience what he's seen and heard in terms of where a country like India makes, makes the next step. Well, thank you very much, um, Zohair, and good morning to everybody. First, let me thank uh, Time and WF for inviting us to this uh, very distinguished meeting and panel. And I'm personally very happy to be here because I have no electricity in my apartment in New York. <laughs> and I have electricity in my house in New Delhi. So I never thought I would be able to ever say that. <laughs> so um, I think with the election of President Obama in, uh, in, uh, in the US, I hope that they will be able to restore my electricity by the time I'm ready to go back to New York. But there's another storm coming today in New York, so we don't know yet. But I'm also very happy to be here because of this discussion um, and other uh, chance to meet so many distinguished people here at this meeting. But let me make two points, Zohair, related to what you said. One is, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, the, we, India, we were, we were, we were, as described very appropriately uh, by, uh, by Vijay Kelka, we were on the golden turnpike of growth. You know, there was a period between just before 2008 where India was growing at 9%. There was talk of going into double-digit growth. And he appropriately said, oh, we are now coasting on the golden turnpike of growth. You know, we can only go up from here. We can't go down. And yet, a few years later, we have exited from that golden turnpike. And we are now in what would be, you know, a pothole uh, side road, if you like, um, back to five, six percent uh, growth. And we are now talking about how to try to get back, uh, well, at least try to maintain this pothole growth rate of five to six percent. And then, of course, hopefully over a period of time, trying to get back to the golden turnpike of 8 9% growth and maybe even higher because the potential for India is even higher than that. So what went wrong was that there was this sort of, uh, of course there was the global crisis, but we have, India's growth rate has gone down 3 to 4 percentage points, whereas other uh, Asian, big Asian countries like China and Indonesia, their growth rate has been affected much less than ours, although they are much more exposed to the international environment than we are. So a lot of our problem on the growth is self-inflicted. And I think your point about that you mentioned this thing about the first generation reforms and the second generation is very appropriate because I think now there's a realization that we were coasting, we were not doing enough reforms to get back to growth, so we need to do that. But unlike the first generation reforms, when we had a deep crisis in 91, when Prime Minister Manmohan Singh took the finance minister, you know, you had a clear blueprint, of course, driven by a crisis of how to get to faster growth. And now we are trying to make that effort, but we don't have a well-defined blueprint of second generation reforms. We have some efforts now for FDI and retail. We have some efforts to control the budget deficit. But I haven't seen anywhere a well-articulated argument for of a series of second generation reforms in, from the government. I haven't seen. I've seen it in the press by various analysts, etc. But, you know, a well-articulated one. And then you look at the five-year plan. Also, it is, it's a good plan, but it's not connected to programs and policies. We have um, sort of a, a, a kind of a distinct situation where we have five-year plan which talks about capital expenditure and what's needed to be done to 
get education and health and this and that and the other. And then we have a finance ministry that focuses on annual uh, budget survey that talks about what needed to be done that year. We don't have anywhere a well-articulated strategy from the government of these second-generation reforms that are so badly needed. Unlike, say, in China, where if you read the Chinese five-year plan, you will see a very clear articulation of policies, programs, and uh, expenditures. So I think we need to think about that as well. It's still one item at a time. We are talking about FDI and retail. We are talking about something else. But nowhere do we have a well-articulated uh, framework for these things. So that's one point I wanted to make. But quickly, a second point, which is that during this period of very fast growth that we saw, brief period nevertheless, somehow we, people got it into their head that because there was this growth and the growth was not so equal, we had to set up a welfare state to take care of the poor. And so we then have, in, a, in my mind, taken up this view that the way to reduce poverty is not to keep this growth going and make it more inclusive, but then to dole out a whole series of welfare programs for the poor, which are very costly, which are now affecting the budget in a very significant way, which are actually hurting growth to some extent because, you know, with the high inflation, we've now had a weakening of the rupee, etc. So we, n we need a welfare system, but we could do this much more cheaply and m in a much more targeted manner than we have so far to take care of those people who would not be able to fully participate in this growth process. Of course, our main effort should be to get more and more people into the growth story as we go forward. Dr. Meyer, um, would, you, would you agree with that, that the government does not have a real grand plan for reform, that the government actually doesn't love reform? Uh, thank you first uh, for inviting me to come and speak here. I was, I thought we were not talking of numbers, so I didn't prepare myself for numbers. I thought we were talking, talking of growth beyond numbers, but we have got stuck again to the same debates about growth and how growth should take place. So let me also answer that part. I think it is interesting that we tend to look at um, a document and then decide that there is no game plan. I think the answer to the question that we have a game plan and that game plan is in line with the topic of today's discussion, which is growth beyond numbers, is where you're looking at what is now termed as a untimely welfare measure that government has taken. Question is this. In a country where you have estimated 35% of the people below the poverty line, should you be looking only at growth or you should be looking at inclusive growth? Uh, to my mind, the answer to that is very clear, especially if you are a democratic country where you uh, pride in, in accepting the values of democracy where people determine how governance should be through voting. Look at one program which is often seen as profligacy on part of government. Mahatma Gandhi, National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. For 60 years, we had a minimum wages act. I have a very, very eminent lawyer sitting to my right, and she will bear me out. Minimum wages act was never enforced, especially in the rural areas, in the unorganized sector, because there was a surplus of labor, and the relationship was that employer drove that uh, relationship. So people have lived, in fact, it is my thesis that India's economy for a very long time has been subsidized by the poor, not the other way around. It has been subsidized by the poor because what is it that we went out and told everybody? Poor, cheap labor. Nothing else is negotiable, but labor is cheap because labor cannot negotiate. And therefore, what Narega did is this. It put a benchmark. And forever we have changed the employer-employee relationship in the rural areas. I'm talking about growth beyond numbers. I'm talking of equity. 
but also the fact i think one needs to look at closely at statistics before announcing a judgment in the last 3 years the total expenditure on narega has steadily come down the total number of people who have gone and asked for jobs in narega has come down it's on the website go and have a look at it what does this mean it means that people the government is not giving out dole that people went for work to narega as long as the employers were not willing to pay them fair wages now when the market wages has come, have come higher when they now the the employee uh, is now able to bargain for better wages on narega works which is under the act you can demand for work the number of people are going down so i think we also tend to be intuitive in our responses to government policies when we look at it i am not here to say that we should not be looking at uh, at growth this is a major concern to us we need to look at growth we need to get back to the same trajectory but as uh, mr chibber said here india is not isolated i mean one may say one may contest whether indonesia 6% is better than 5.5 or 6% of india i mean one can contest that but the issue is that there is a global slowdown they the best governed within inverted commas countries are facing fiscal cliff next year we do not know how that landing will be and that's going to affect everyone including india so let's not lose sight of the fact that the slow down is also because of global factors and how they have affected the countries around us that's that's a very pertinent point dr mayaram i'd like to turn to david because i know that uh, uh, th there's been a lot of negativity about india in the last couple of days at the world economic <laughs> forum uh, but i know that you have a sense of looking at the glass as being half full rather than half empty that's one point that i'd like to ask you about and i do want to come back to growth in the rural areas i know harish has also very very clear thoughts about that but you also have ideas about how to make the urban centers the traditional centers of growth and the places where the government tends to focus on and big business tends to focus on how to make them them smarter smarter infrastructure more technologically advanced and so on and so forth so these two points i'd like like you to address david Th thank thank you very much sir and it's, it's a real uh, honor and privilege to be here and uh let me give you a view somewhat from the outside of india although i am a frequent visitor it's interesting actually uh i look after the global geographic uh activities within accenture and just this year have moved my base to shanghai and china so i thought that if we're going to focus on the emerging markets i'd better be part of it and um it it's interesting contrasting and i'm sure uh, you know, a lot of the last couple of days has been China and India. Um, I suppose if I, and I'll come to one of the priorities, but uh, the experience of landing in Shanghai Airport and going to my apartment in Pudong is somewhat different to arriving in cities here. And you know, if you just look at infrastructure, it's a very different experience. But le but let me come back to the theme. I felt yesterday a lot of the panel discussions were focusing on the challenges, on the problems. and i'm sure they're very real so i i don't want to undermine them but to me and i think the theme of this session is look at the opportunity look at the opportunity for india as a great nation in the global context and you know, if you say build on your strengths uh, one area which is clearly and there's a lot written about of the population demographics you know with uh, you know compared to china which i think is going to have significant challenges with an aging population india has a very vibrant population um you know today nearly 20% of the world's population one third under 50 projected to be the world's largest population by 2030 and that in itself creates an enormous opportunity from my perspective the priorities uh would be firstly infrastructure and uh, you know basic infrastructure around power we were talking about you know renewable solar power being a very interesting opportunity in the rural areas water transportation and again the contrast with china is quite marked and to me the key thing is 
find ways to do it. I think some of the bureaucracy, some of the difficulties of making decisions and getting things done here are a challenge. Secondly, education, but particularly relevant skills. My sense is that a lot of the education maybe is traditional, hasn't really attuned with the needs for people to be job ready. You know, I, I heard in some of the research that there was projected to need to be 15 million people per annum in India with job relevant skills, an additional 15 billion. And you know, that, that again is a huge opportunity if we can actually make that happen. Uh, healthcare clearly is a priority, but underpinning it all and coming back to your question, I think information technology and some of the current developments in IT are an enormous opportunity for India to address some of these problems. And I would particularly talk about broadband, and I know the Indian government has a very active and uh, broadband policy, but then linking that with mobile computing, you know, just in the last three years, the advancement in terms of handheld devices, access to information. And this truly, I believe, creates an opportunity to deal with the divide to deal with the rural disadvantaged people and maybe to make them the future champions. So to summarize, I, I think you know, lots of opportunities. I think today we have, an we, we have a, a real time where IT, which of course India is already advanced in, but could dramatically change and remove some of the barriers and actually give India the opportunity to leapfrog other countries in terms of the advancement. David, you mentioned uh, uh, the demographics, and uh, clearly uh, a country with a sizable young population tends to, th th there's a lot of potential for growth because younger populations tend to be, frankly, more creative, yeah. more dynamic. They create resources rather than use up resources. You mentioned China, but of course in Asia, the country with the biggest problem on that front is actually Japan. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, this can be a double-edged sword. Uh, Rajna uh, Rajya Kanoria of FICCI was telling us, was telling Time, that the, that the uh, you know, talking about this half, the glass half full or half empty, that the demographic uh, issue in, in, in India, it can be a demographic dividend or it can be a demographic time bomb because you have to find jobs for all these people. Um, uh, does anyone, someone wish to address that? I mean, is that, is that actually realistic that uh, all these young people First thing, they're going to get educated, and second, that they will be able to get good jobs. Anyone? Dr. Mayaram? Yeah. Uh, actually, if you look at uh, the, the points which uh, have re uh, been made, I think they're very relevant. In fact, uh, uh, even in the 12th plan, if you look at it and otherwise, we have a skill development mission now. Recognizing this fact that we require, uh, you know, skilling at least 10 million people every month, if you really want to reach the number of 500 million in, by 2022, which is what is targeted. Uh, there is a huge challenge for providing the right type of skills which will match the demand of the, uh, of the industry. And therefore, one very uh, innovative area of the skill development mission is to work with the private sector for creating uh, training infrastructure, skill development infrastructure. And a lot of work has been done there. In fact, a very unique public-private sector, uh, private uh, partnership has been uh, company has been created as a national skill development com corporation, where government has 49 percent and the private sector has 51 percent uh, ownership, which is uh, but the government provides the funding for this private company to on lend or take equity uh, positions in skill development companies and create and develop these skill development companies through which skilling will take place. Uh, a large number of companies have already come into into being, and they are doing very good work on that side. So that that I think is a is an area which is now fully addressed. I know that you're one of the sort of perhaps one of the rare officials in the Indian administration that is actually a proponent of public-private partnerships. Uh, um, but at the same time, people say the bureaucracy is more of a problem than even the solution. I want to bring Zia Modi in in here. Uh, do you, I mean, I think you have thoughts about that. 
uh, 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 you're not you're not in business, but That's you deal with a lot of business That's people, and of course, you have to deal with all the legal hurdles and hoops that you have to jump through. You know, Zia. Um, I think uh, what I see in the last uh, few months, at least, uh, that there is a definite awareness by government that there are things that just need to get done, and therefore the bureaucratic will, the political will, as I see it, is to clearly try and find solutions. Um, the legacy of all the problems, I don't think, go away overnight. And uh, I don't think uh, I'm a believer of a big bang reform theory uh, by our government. I believe in small steps, effective steps at a time, because I am convinced that we have to take the social fabric along with us. Otherwise, the demographic dividend does become the nightmare that we talked about. But in terms of public-private partnerships, my view is that uh, uh, India Inc. is uh, more than willing to engage, uh, not because it's charitable, because it benefits India Inc. Uh, government is, at the end of the day, the giver of concessions, the giver of land, the giver of minerals. And if the country has to grow, uh, the government and India Inc. Uh, cannot do it alone. So there is an awareness, but there is also a sense of uh, will it happen soon enough? I think there are issues of corruption uh, that uh, stay in the minds of uh, uh, India Inc. I think there is uh, a cleansing which is taking place uh, over the last few years that uh, I personally have not seen before. But there is still much to be done. So every time you have land acquisition, permits, uh, leases, uh, all of these come with a bundle of anxieties. Uh, if you have public-private partnerships, you have always banks around the corner at some stage, and uh, lenders are anxious, foreign lenders are even more anxious, uh, take out financing. If we have our infrastructure with our public-private partnerships, you need a trillion dollars. Where is that really going to come from? I don't think our balance sheet for the banks is that, that broad or deep. So are we going to get enough investor confidence in the country with a true public-private partnership? Some have worked. Some have still to work. I personally believe that in health and education, those are easier to do uh, because the, the inclusiveness is a given to start with. So, you know, you're not disconnected in philosophical ways. In, in resources, it's them versus us. But in health and education, it just has to be together. You look at 900 million mobile subscribers. I think the government is clear that with the IT technology and the UID uh, program that Nandan is, is putting together for the government, mm -hmm. that has to be a way to make it more inclusive. You look at 250,000 gram panchayats that the government is committed to get broadband to very soon. That has to open up e-learning. It has to open up uh, doctors being able to communicate with health workers in the villages. So these are, these are very natural, robust, and possible private partnerships with the government. I want to come back to corruption and, and to the big business initiative by the five or so uh, uh, major uh, uh, business houses in India. But I want to turn to Harish. Um, Dr. Mayaram was talking about the Renega you know, uh, scheme, which is the biggest employment scheme of its kind in the world, um, is, is you go out into the countryside a lot. You, you mix with, with the real people of India. The real people of India are not in this room uh, 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 in some ways. Uh, is the government doing enough? Can the government do more? Yeah, thanks. Sir. Should I take my chair a little forward uh, rather than getting hit by both <laughs> sides? No. Uh, <laughs> no. We, we deliberately <laughs> put you there. <laughs> No, I, I, I'll come to, uh, I'll start with a statement that you said, should India be kinder or gentler? I think India should be sensitive. I think that's the issue we have. It's not about kinder or gentler. It's, we are not, we're becoming more and more insensitive. I mean, for example, look at the media and look at everybody else was talking about Sandy, Hurricane Sandy, but nobody was really talking about Neelam, which has much, had much greater human disaster in Andhra Pradesh in the last one week. None of the newspapers, it's on the front page. I mean, 10 times more than Sandy. We are still talking about, in our papers, it's not only you because you're personally affected, but you know, about power cuts in Manhattan, but nobody's talking about AP, right? Andhra Pradesh, much larger. And that is the insensitivity I'm actually scared about. 
and and that disconnect that disconnect between many of us in this room is startling and that i think we need to, it's not about the government it's not about it's together we are we are we getting we are talking about i mean i i agree with mr Ma, we are we are on the subsidies of the poor but on the other hand we are also using the poor we are hiding behind the poor in terms of when we come to our climate change negotiations in terms of because we are saying that oh we have so many poor people i think on the name of the poor our consumption level in the rich is increasing right and and so i think there has to be a sense of sensitivity inclusiveness in a growth where we create ecosystems for the poor to equally be part of this long growth story and then i'm 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 rega right uh, the uh, the enrega scheme the thing is that uh, yes it's it was a fantastic scheme it is a fantastic scheme but as i said earlier we we have also created enough loopholes to to actually create so much loopholes to actually misuse the enrega scheme in many ways right it's i i think we need to broaden the scheme enrega scheme has today become digging a scheme of digging in the sense that digging tanks digging tank bonds i think we should broaden the services of emrega broaden the use utilization of so much of money that's there in the government to build the ecosystem for the poor to create enterprises it's classically that's there but i would i would still rate it at 4 out of 10 of what's happening in the rural areas ajay so can i say yeah because undp is actually the only international organization that the government has invited to work with it in emrega so we have been working very closely with the government and of course we believe in the philosophy of enrega but uh, like you said um you know you don't want a permanent dole you want a, you want a system that will create assets help people with water problems land degradation problems basic infrastructure in the rural areas so from that perspective the scheme has been designed in that way well but you do want to be able to create assets so that you don't have to keep handing doing these handouts all the time we need a we need to give people a hand up not a hand out forever so what many of these schemes were designed with the right intent but they have they have become so costly they have, there's so much bureaucratic inefficiencies and leakages but this hope you could I end up we are hope. missing the point actually we have now gotten into discussing a scheme yeah. i mean that's not the idea yeah. of this, this this discussion i you, i mean i can i can accept there may be problems and then it's asymmetrical it is state uh, specific and so on and we can be improved it's a that's a point i mean when we can have a different session on narega and and dissect right. it But the fact is that narega was meant to do a serve a purpose and that major objective it has served namely providing the bargaining power to the poor in the rural areas now it has been done well it could be done better etc is another issue we can discuss that subsequently but what is more important we need to see when we are looking at growth beyond numbers and that's why we need to come back to this broader discussion that we are doing one for instance is this whole issue about whether we are being able to move on to the next level i think on public private partnership it's very well spoken of that we now require uh, to broaden the the canvas and that's why we are now looking very uh, uh, you know at this point of time we are engaged with looking at the the possibility of licenses to new banks because you really need to expand the financial sector in that manner we have recently launched the infrastructure development fund scheme where in fact already uh, we have a list of about 7 which have already got listed now idfs which is the take out finance that 1 trillion dollar that we are talking of this is a take out finance which comes in one year after the cod of a project and and there is a great enthusiasm in sovereign wealth funds and others abroad i have recently spoken to many people from hong kong and from other places who are looking at this idf with great interest so there is a there is a method in our madness and let me say this <laughs> uh if everybody thinks there's no plan that the government doesn't work to our plan but i think it is not correct but sir I, we I, are I, seeing the entire thing and we are working on it which is one part which is on the growth part but at the same time there is this very large area which is as uh, has been mentioned 
of the poor which need to be taken care of. I think you have missed out on one announcement which the, uh, which the Prime Minister made recently. Then in the next five, and this is part of the plan document also if somebody reads it carefully. Next five years, subsidies will be cash subsidies and targeted to the poor through the unique identity program. Now, which is a veg, very major step in a country where, as I said, 35% are below poverty line. So the numbers, I mean, we need to be looking at numbers. You know, it's very easy for us to speak of this should be done and that should be done and it should be done more efficiently and it should be done more effectively. I don't deny that. But you, when you look at numbers, 35% translates to more than 350 million people which would be about the population of European Union. No, but sir, sir, the so, uh, no, uh, what I'm saying is you're right, it should be done better. But there is a plan to it. It's not as if it's uh, nobody's looking at it and it's going by default. It is not like no, that. No, but we are also letting the other people get away. Sir, it's not only the role of the government in our country. It has to be the role of the citizen, the corporate sector and the media, I think, which is also not playing the role of the... Uh, poverty level. So I would rather look at India rather than China. I would ra for the future because this is a country I would ra today uh, in China I will not be able to sit with the Secretary of the Finance and, and, and have a debate, uh, number one. And, uh, and tell him uh, he's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> 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 right. And then, then I'll have two more, two more guards sitting outside <laughs> waiting for me. <laughs> right. And secondly, the thing is that if I have to create innovations in the rural areas as a private citizen, along with the rural banking sector, this is a country. This is a country which will show the future of innovation for removing poverty in a sustainable manner for Africa, Indonesia, and rest of the developing world of 4 billion people. That's where I have hope on. Because today, if I have been working in 18 years, it's, it's not, I mean, there has been no interference, but for me, is the greatest barrier is the insensitivity of the rich or, or, the, or the people who have made it. That's for me is more dangerous. And that I think everybody should realize that this is a country that has 500 million pe poor people and is the second fastest growing. It's a, it's a hypo, it's a, it's a, it's a, dude, it's a paradox. I think paradox. you can make that paradox in a way becomes the center of innovation for the poor for the world. I think that's what China will not be able to prove that. I think we have that opportunity. David. Uh, I'd, I'd like to pick up a bit on this uh, public-private partnerships because I think that this is a very powerful enabler. It was interesting, two weeks ago I was in Seoul in South Korea uh, actually looking with the government there who are very actively looking at what they call a tripartite relationship between business, government business and the citizen. Uh, and if you look at some of the examples and look elsewhere, I would probably single out Brazil as being a country which has really, really made advances just in the last couple of years in terms of uh, the city regeneration. So I think you know, look to examples uh, and build on those. Uh, since, since I was introduced as uh, having a half full view, I'd like to, you know, I, I, I'm happy to <laughs> have that view. But it, you, know, you can look at problems and I'm sure that bureaucracy, corruption are very real issues we need to deal with. But it's interesting if I just look at Accenture um, actually, India is by far the largest of our global business. We have over 80,000 people now employed in India uh, across all dimensions of the country. And we've had a program running for two years around building skills for people, uh, particularly you know, disadvantaged people. How can they get job-ready skills? And already we've had more than 15,000. I mentioned that. It's a small number in the context of what we need to do. But I think build on what's already happening you know, and, and, and also look outside India to Brazil, to other countries on how you can really you know, make progress and beyond the obstacles. I'd like to, with time permitting, ask Harish and RJ about specific examples of rural development that they have seen, that they have experienced or spearheaded uh, elsewhere, but before we, we get to that, if we have time towards the end, I want to, all of you have good intentions. You are all patriots. Even David, you are a patriot as well. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps the most zealous. <laughs> 
But the one thing that, again, a recurring theme here is that, uh, you, know, you know, a big curse that India, India, India is undergoing is, is, is the C word, you know, corruption. Uh, uh, I was at a, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a discussion on Tuesday morning about corruption. That was a closed-door session. And it seemed that we were having tremendous difficulty arriving at solutions. We were comparing with other countries, but it just didn't seem to apply. There was talk about uh, creating an anti-corruption agency in India, but some people said that that would just turn into another bureaucratic ministry uh, or department that would actually become the most corrupt. Um, Zia, I know you have thoughts about this. How, how bad is the problem? What actually ca realistically can be done about this? I mean, everyone is concerned about it. I think the solution is not with me, but I think the concerns... <laughs> I, saw, I saw your hand was moving this way. I think to, your, to your left. <laughs> I think, you know, it's... it's what it's, she means, the solution lies with the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a question of uh, really uh, balancing out why corruption exists and seeing if we can give some incentives to stop it. So I've always been of the view that, you know, the, the numbers of petty corruption, they say in India, 80% of the corruption is petty corruption. Uh, the traffic cop, the cylinder, the ration card. And if you look at 80% being that, then you wonder why is it so much at the lower level? And logic then leads you to the conclusion that the people that are taking these sort of petty bribes are those that are poorly paid. Uh, compared to, as I've said earlier, you have a... a, a, a grade four public official who earns maybe 15,000 a month, 20,000 a month. He has four children to get married. He has to pay dowry still for his girl child. Um, it is not physically possible for him to sustain a livelihood at that level. Now, I've often said, why doesn't government increase the salaries of these people? Uh, government turns around and says, it's just not these people. It's then millions and millions of people. Um, but if we take a balance of how much we lose in corruption, not only in the monetary uh, loss, but also in the perception loss, uh, in uh, you know, all the softer issues that come with it, then maybe there is a case for us to say, if somebody ought not to be corrupt because he has enough and can sustain himself, then you can hang him. But, you know, to take away... Um, uh, to talk in very grand ideas that corruption can be just brushed away. There's much more to it. Nobody's justifying it, obviously, and cannot. But I think that 80% being petty corruption, I think there are solutions there that could be, you know, through the system made viable. So perhaps, you know, higher pay, better education, values, mm -hmm. family values, and so on and so forth. Ajay, you, but you, also, yeah, you, 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 you've um, seen experiences yeah. elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, mean I think... It comes back to these second generation reforms because, you know, if you look at the doing business index, you, you are the last in the world in the amount of time it takes to get a construction permit and many other permits that you need. You're almost the last in the world in contract dispute resolution. So you have, a, 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 you have done the first generation reforms, but you still have so much government interference at so many levels, and it's not just petty. It's at all levels that you, unless you carry out a raft of those, uh, what, what we would call uh, clear, clearing the, the brush, as it were, of all these regulations and interferences, you will inevitably have corruption. Now, of course, salaries will help a little bit, but to reduce, to increase government salaries, you would have to halve the size of the government. Otherwise, you couldn't afford it. And that's what China did. I mean, China is not solved the corruption problem entirely, but China carried out a very major public uh, administration reform under Prime Minister Chu Rongji some 15 years into their reform. We need to get that kind of a reform uh, going as well. So, there's a, you know, it's all connected. C corruption is just the symptom of a dysfunctional interface between the public sector and the rest of the society, and that's what we need to address you know, setting up a corruption commission will not solve this problem. Petty corruption. Uh, sorry, is may I just no. add? Yes. E-governance, yeah, I think, ah. is going to be yeah, a, a huge uh, 
uh, step in the right direction. And I think the government, again, as I see it, is committed to it. Yep. Two things have helped. One is the Right to Information Act. Uh, the government has passed it, right? And the government is saying, sometimes it regrets the, the length to which it went, but it basically says, you can see how we function. Okay, that has to be a, a deterrent to functioning in a completely arbitrary manner. And when you have e-governance where you see how your application is moving, why it's moving in a certain way, that again has a natural check and balance in the system. So I feel that if e-governance is increased, more proliferated, especially in the states, yes. where really the problem is, when we go for infrastructure, when we go for permissions, it's not just a central subject, it's a state subject as well. Some states have actually gone into e-governance. Yes. Some should be going into e-governance. Land should be, you know, everybody's uh, land should be basically made available as a title document. So I think these steps which are moving in the right direction will improve. But I think that there still has to be a structural incentive for many, many people in the government at the lower level to feel that now it's really not justified to take that petty car. Let, uh, let me just say this. I think corruption should be seen... Uh, from three perspectives. One, petty corruption, as you've said, is, is one part of it. But one is what we call collusive corruption. In fact, my complaint always is that people who speak from such rostrum actually collude to create corruption system. Income tax is a very easy example. For us. It's corporate tax. So you will pay a, a, a tax officer so that you will have to pay less tax. And then you will stand and say, the bureaucracy is very corrupt. So, I mean, there is a collusion in that. I think we need to have a very clear... Very pertinent point, point, yeah. Number two, we must understand mm -hmm. that today our awareness of corruption is much, much more mm -hmm. because of some of the mm -hmm. laws that have been passed, like RTI, for instance, or the freedom of media. So therefore, we are more aware of corruption. It is not as if corruption has increased that much, but the awareness is much greater now than it was earlier. And that, I think, is a starting point of dealing with it. Because once you get more exposes, then more people are also careful in terms of not being uh, uh, corrupt so that they will be caught and they will be uh, charged and they will be punished. The third part here is government needs to import greater predictability in its in, in its function. And many state governments have started doing that. For instance, if you look at Bihar and the state of Rajasthan, many other states have also done, they have passed laws called the Service Delivery Acts, where they have prescribed timelines that if you put an application for something, it will take 15 days for a response. If it is 30 days, uh, this much and that. If, if an officer does not do that in time, then that officer is punished. So there is now a law which prescribes this which brings, in, you know, uh, a predict certain predictability to the government system. It seems also that uh, Indian society has reached a turning point where you've got this critical mass of now uh, anger uh, 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 about corruption, that it is a truly a huge, huge, perhaps the single biggest problem that, that India faces in terms of progressing. I want to open things up to the floor. Um, uh, Anyone who feel, you know, feels free to make a point or ask questions, I ask that you, you stand up and identify yourself. You have to stand up so that the cameras can get you. So this is really for the record. Yourself, please. Your name and your wh whoever you represent or whatever you represent. Nisha Agarwal. I'm the CEO of Oxfam India. It's an NGO. Uh, I think the session was about how do we make India shine for everybody. We heard some concrete suggestions from Mr. Tomlinson, the comparison with China, saying we need to invest much more in health, education, and infrastructure. I don't think anybody in India would disagree with that, that that is a way of spreading growth. The problem is we don't seem to be having the will to collect enough resources to invest in those things. If you look at our collection of taxes, it's 9% of GDP. Almost a similar amount is given away as corporate exemptions. Now, if the corporate sector wants to, India to be competitive in the long run, is it not better to collect that 9% of GDP that is being given away as exemptions and actually invest in health, education, and infrastructure, which would make us more competitive in the long run and spread the benefits of growth? So that's one question. What is a better use of our resources? 
I think a second question to Ajay, he was saying, you know, the trickle down model is really not the right way to deliver inclusive development in India. Uh, we, we seem to have a theory that let the rich grow, tax them and then provide welfare. Many other parts of the world have defined inclusive development very differently. I think people haven't defined it here. So Ajay, if you could describe what that model is in your head that you said is an alternative way that other countries have developed, delivered much more inclusive growth than India is doing. Thank you. Would, would someone like to tackle that, the first part? Yeah, uh, uh, or, or, or you'd like to go first? The, uh, I think uh, uh, the Secretary mentioned, uh, you know, labor. And you talked about the demographic dividend. Of course, our biggest, uh, the, the most valuable factor of production we have is labor. And if we want to create a more inclusive growth model, then we have to be able to have much greater manufacturing employment in this country, small scale and large scale as well. But we have, we have actually made, in the interest of protecting our labor, we have made uh, our labor very expensive because we have the most arcane labor laws that you can find anywhere in the world. So it makes it very hard for people to really uh, think of India as a destination for uh, <laughs> You know, large-scale manufacturing because simply because the labor laws come there are other problems infrastructure and land acquisition and all are also there but labor laws have been a major hindrance now to the employability of labor in regular uh, jobs in which they are not classified as working poor we did a survey after the 2008 crisis together with seva in five or six different uh, business centers in India, Coimbatore, Surat, uh, Ludhiana, you know, looking at how did people cope with the crisis that came in 2008. And what we discovered was increasing casualization of labor, basically employers shedding whatever little labor they had so that they could then uh, rehire them back in contract labor. Most of these people became then the working poor. They still had, were working four or five hours a day, but they were you know, much more on this, what we call casual labor in India, contract labor, basically. So we need to think about la changing those labor laws in a way that will really help build this country up along with other factors like infrastructure into a major manufacturing hub, which will be much more inclusive. I mean, the Secretary mentioned, of course, access to finance, which I think is a very important area also for more inclusive uh, growth uh, in this country. So. We have to think not of a model in which there will be growth and then we will tax these people and then we will take care of these poor people. We have to get people much more involved in the economic processes that will lead to permanent reduction in uh, dependence and in poverty. Harish, can you give us an example, you know, from your own experience of either a program or a scheme that has that has worked, whether it is your own organization, in the countryside, Absolutely. where we can get away from the urban centers. Uh, uh, no, yeah, exactly. I, I, like, I like the bureaucracy, if it's delayed, because otherwise people would have overrun the poor. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Because uh, in less, people getting farter, faster permissions, so the poor would have actually suffered in terms of lands. And I, I look at it that way, so I'm very happy. <laughs> In different, but the question to yes, so we also understand. So there are forty thousand banks in this country, rural areas. No other country has this infrastructure. It was built during the green. Let's like take the example of how green revolution actually took place. Mm. There is you had you have forty thousand banks, rural gramina banks, which financed to the end users. You have eight hundred plus technical institutes like the ITIs and the root cities. So you have institutes that can create the ecosystem, human resources, <coughs> to 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 balance the uh, people who actually get, take the loan from the, like whether the farmers who take loan from the rural banks, you have the ecosystem to develop that. Today what we need to do is that a lot of the capital is for English-speaking entrepreneurs. You do not have equity investments in aurya speaking entrepreneur. You do not have equity investments into Bengali-speaking entrepreneur. We have created English as a class. I think we need to break that. There are, there's a solid infrastructure of 40,000 banks, 600, 8,000 plus technical institutes, to create thousands of enterprises, which a country like China will not be able to do, the democratization of, of enterprise, democratization of energy services, democratization of water resources, it's all there. So the 
hard work of creating the infrastructure was done in the 70s. We just need to do a little tweaking of the efficiency, and we are there. We are running a marathon, not a 10,000 meter race, <laughs> like China or the US. I think we'll, we'll get there. But uh, let me also add uh, to 40,000 branches that you've spoken of, uh, government's decision to set up by next March in every habitation of 2,000 or more, which is, does not have a branch, a business bank, banking business PC, correspondent, personal. which will provide financial inclusive services of right. the nature which you're mentioning, is already underway. And by next year, March, we would have all the habitations with a population of 2,000 and more having business correspondence. So what I want to add is that but we need to respect the non, we need to create equity instruments and debt instruments for the non-English speakers. Yeah. And that's, I think the people in this room, we are all become middlemen and we are no, not but letting, but are, no, I, yeah. I'm yeah. Okay. Comp, I mean, <laughs> not so much. It's all of us together. We, we have not created the instruments for them to come up. And you tell me, so one example of equity instrument, because everything is Word, Excel sheet and PowerPoint. 70% of the country does not know that. And need, we need to break that barrier. May I just shift point. into one comment, which is if we want a gentler India and an India beyond numbers. We have not talked about our gender. Yeah. And the World Bank has said that uh, one of India's lowest hanging fruit is its 250 yeah. million women. Um, and I think there the plans of the government to bring the women into the microfinance space, into the gram panchayats, um, that I think is going to be a huge push into growing beyond numbers. So maybe Dr. Maharam could tell us what, I think much has been done, uh, but the targeted focus on this class uh, of what can propel India to some extent, uh, I think would be fascinating. I think the first starting point is that, uh, again, coming to the same program, Narega, which is much maligned and much extolled, uh, there the primacy is for opening bank accounts for women. Yep. And the other interesting thing is that in under Narega, no wage is paid other than through a bank account. So every worker who registers, and more than 50% are women, Gets a, bank account. gets a bank account and the money gets transferred to her account. So there is already a very conscious effort for getting women into the econo economy, the organized economy yeah. of the country. They always have been in the economy of the country, but in the organized economy of the country, there is a very conscious effort in that direction. David, you, you wanted to say something. I, well, firstly, just picking up on, on the comment um, and coming back to technology, uh, I, I actually think you know, right now with broadband mobile computing increasing the access to banking in rural community, we're seeing this some very big advances in Indonesia, and I'm sure this is going to become a very relevant enabler. But coming back to the, uh, the first question, um, or the first question from the audience, um, I'm not going to be qualified to talk about the allocation of taxes. So I'll uh, leave that <laughs> to, to, to our people here. But in terms of you know, my perspective, <coughs> and the key message for India, when you contrast to China, is getting things done. You know, my, my sense is you know, the, the, the big difference, and uh, I mentioned earlier I live in Pudong in Shanghai, which people have been there as you know, an incredibly bustling metropolis. Fifteen years ago, it was marshland. And you know, that is a great example of decision-making, implementing, doing things. You know, in the World's Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report, uh, which was circulated to everyone, you know, the top three issues, inadequate supply of infrastructure, we talked about corruption, inefficient government, bureaucracy. You know, those are the three top issues identified in the Corruption Index. Uh, my sense, actually, is that, again, technology will be an enabler e-government starts creating transparency, maybe the opportunity to mm. improve and streamline processes. Which I would, I would like still to uh, like to put a rider on the manner in which, for instance, Shanghai is set up. <laughs> I put a rider on that. Yeah. I don't know whether we would wish to go that way. Uh, because the kind of decision making that you are um, extolling at the moment is not a decision-making where citizens have any say. I, I, now, if we are saying we should go that way, 
then we need to go to a more fundamental question of what kind of governance we should have. Mm. And so I think we need to be extremely careful when we give examples in that manner, which also should then yep. give the underpinning of that decision. I, I, whether we would really wish yeah. to go that way. Yeah. I mean, I, I mm. don't think we will wish to go yeah, that can, way. Can I, can I say, I, I, I totally agree and understand that point, but I think if you look at why is progress not happening, then you need to work out how do you move the barriers, how do you streamline to there get There again, done. I will uh, point that why progress is not happening at the pace at which we wish it should happen. It is not why progress is not happening. I think there are two different things. But pe people do have a visceral reaction to that. I, I, was having, uh, I was meeting an Indian executive a few days ago, and she had just seen the latest Bond film, Skyfall. And you'll notice that there's, there's a scene when James Bond... Daniel Craig goes to Shanghai, and that's real. That's not uh, 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 CGI. And she said when she saw those scenes of those Shanghai Pudong skyscrapers, she thought, when will Delhi and Bombay, Mumbai ever have that? Uh, Ritika, I want to ask, uh, uh, give you a chance to ask something. Uh, could you identify yourself and where you come from? Please. Please. My name is Ritika Khera, and I teach at the uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Delhi. Uh, but that's a recent uh, identity. I've actually spent the past 10 years doing quite a lot of work in rural areas, studying some of these issues, including uh, NREGA. So uh, I'll just take two minutes, uh, if that's all right. Yeah, we'll um, eat into a little bit of the community break time, because I see right now nobody is leaving. OK, so then <laughs> I'll take three. Um, so two, two, two. two. <laughs> Okay, so I want, to, I want yeah. to go back to what you started with, which is this thing from Akash Kapoor, which say, you know, people want growth with justice. But actually, I think people, the, at least the India I've seen, people want justice with growth. Their main concern is with justice, which means access to education, healthcare, food, employment, livelihood, etc. And I find it really incredible that somebody can say today in India that we're spending too much on welfare. Uh, according to Montek Singh Aluwalia's paper in EPW, uh, all our social spending, including health, education, NREGA, PDS, etc., is about 2.2% of the GDP. Revenue foregone, which Nisha alluded to earlier, uh, tax revenue foregone, according to the budget, is 5% of GDP. So I really think there's something very problematic, and I think Harish is exactly right. 35% of the people are below poverty line. The poverty line is at 35 rupees a day. I'm not sure if you can buy anything in this hotel for 35 rupees a day. And we're setting, aside, we're setting aside 2% of our GDP for this 35%. So I think there is an element of hypocrisy and a, an element of lip service uh, to the question of inclusiveness. We talk about UID, but UID is not going to do anything about inclusiveness unless we increase our uh, spending on welfare. We um, talk about inclusiveness, and I'm happy you brought up the question of education and skill training, but you can't expect a country to participate in opportunities if they can't read and write. So, you know, we really have to get our priorities right, and uh, we're just sort of missing the big picture. We don't want to take the tough decisions, which is really to tax more, to widen the tax base, because I think there's plenty of scope for that. Uh, I'm sure there's like 10% or 20% of the population that uh, pays taxes. So, you know, there's immense scope for increasing the size of the budget. I don't think the Indian government is very large. If you look at something as simple as teacher-pupil ratios across the world, India isn't doing very well. If we had too much government, then our ratios would be comparable to the rest of the world. So I think there is, uh, you know, this hypocrisy does, and the lip service to inclusiveness is quite anybody, problematic. Does anybody want to push back? <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. I, I, think, yeah. I think that's right. I mean, if we have, you know, we, we have something called the Human Development Index, right, which is made up of income, education, and health. And we focus a lot on inequality in income. But actually, when you look at inequality in health and in education, it is much larger in India. The inequality in health and education is much larger than the inequality even in income. And we are concerned about income. So we should be even more concerned about the inequalities in education and access to education and health. So, so that's, of course, very right. I, I mean, yes, if, 
if we can get the GST going and we can raise our revenue to a modern state requires about 20 percent uh, of GDP in government today to run, at least 20 percent. We don't have that, as Nisha said. And, you know, of course, uh, finance minister is trying to bring the GST and all that, and that should uh, raise these, and removing these exemptions would be a very good idea, and reforming our tax system would be a good idea, and raising. But that said, given where we are today, I don't mean to say that we are not spend, we are spending enough on education or health or not. But we could be with much better targeting along the lines of these cash transfers, etc. We could protect the poor much better than we are today with much less expenditure than we are incurring. So I think that is the point that we are in the na as you said, in the name of the poor. We are doing things, programs are being doled out, but actually the poor are not really benefiting from those programs. Better targeting to, could get money to the poor much better than uh, the schemes that we I have today. Have but I am still very optimistic. I don't want to, I'm sounding a bit too pessimistic on India. I remain very optimistic. I think this elephant, you know, India has been described, described to being like an elephant. The elephant started to move in the 90s, and then somehow it stumbled again. And if we can get this elephant back again moving, I think India will have a very, very bright future. I think we need to be very careful because I think we get into rhetoric very quickly, very easily, because the words sound nice to us. If we said n they don't at all benefit the poor, is it our case that their poverty has not been reduced in this country? Is this our case? I don't think that is backed by any statistics, including the UN statistics. I'm quite sure if one looked deeply into it. Poverty levels have come down. People, I mean, there are less poor people now than they were 20 years ago. I mean, nobody can deny that. Fact is, and I agree with you, that we need to do more, and that's the point I started with, that in my thesis, poor subsidize, have subsidized the economy for a long time which is a fact. Now, question about more taxation, less taxation, it's a very fine balance. I have seen times in the government when our taxes were very high. One of the reasons why investments would not take place, why black money would get accumulated was very high taxation. Then we said international standard of taxation, let us bring it down to 30%, which is what everywhere is. We did that, compliance became better. More investment started coming in, triggered growth. Ultimately, without growth, you cannot have any poverty reduction programs either. I mean, they may be done much better, they may be targeted much better. I mean, I'm not denying all that, but you still need growth. So how far do you make this balance? These numbers sound very nice from where you are looking. I mean, just now, Mr. Chibber spoke about the elephant. I think we also sometimes become like the six blind men looking at the elephant and trying to decipher it, depending on from where we are looking at it. So we close our eyes and say it's a wall, and you know, like, uh -huh. so it's it's like that. It's an exercise all the time when we look at India. Different people are looking at it differently. From a social activist point of view, I would completely agree that we should remove all tax exemptions. We should raise taxes to 60 percent. We should completely squeeze out the capitalist, and then do the good things for the poor people. I mean, it's a, it's a point of view. I On the other hand, the entrepreneur would say, give me freedom, give me enough incentive to, to uh, make profit, which is how I will contribute to growth. These are balances that one need to do in a society. You, do, can't, you don't go swing from one side to the other side. Yes. So we need to find a balance, and I think that is what we uh, pre pretty much must do. But at the same time, I grant, we need to do things better. We cannot say, you know, claim victory that we have done everything the best way that we, we should have. There are huge number of improvements that need to be done. But at the same time, I do not see any cause for pessimism as far as India is concerned. I am extremely optimistic. And I do believe next two years' time, you will see the trajectory going back again. And the interesting thing is, the funny thing is the numbers determine our mood also. 
it's like uh, you know so when the growth is 9% everyone sitting here will speak nothing but pains of what is good with india when the number goes to 5.5 or 6% everybody is so pessimistic about the entire history of india i think that is what surprises me very much okay we're going to have still say balance we yeah, need we're to look at the balance we well, have one question from the floor and then i'm going to ask harish to end uh, 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 please identify yourself my name is satish patil my question is about the whole theme of this discussion today about uh, somehow i get a sense as if uh, uh, growth rate is quite contradictory to the social upliftment and as if they are mutually exclusive if you see the per capita income of the asian economies about couple of decades ago with india uh, they made a rapid progress in their overall uh, per capita income by way of economic growth so why do we here say that it has to be inclusive and if you say inclusive is it not uh, automatically ensured when there is a more inflow coming when there is a growth is it not available for social upliftment otherwise where the money is going to come from so why do we think of them as contradictory or or mutually exclusive things harish i was going to turn to you anyway and i think i think you are the right person for this anyway no i th i think it's very i mean if you look at uh, uh, please 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 take some time for a month and travel sir travel no no come with me sir <laughs> with me i i will sh i mean it's 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 easy to say that the trickle down effect happened the trickle down effect today is about rather than having one maid servant we'll have two maid servants so trickle down effect is i'll have now four more houses and i'll hire three more drivers that's not trickle down effect the money should to be gone to create of job. jobs and enterprises in the rural areas where rather than looking at the poor as future employees we should look at the poor as future employers very good and they become why can't a poor become a head of a corporate tomorrow that is more scary sir and secondly i also the thing is that we all talk about again a challenge to the see the problem i'm so i'm pessimistic about the urban youth i'm optimistic of the rural youth I, and and because urban youth is spending too much of time on research i i think the urban youth needs to get down and look at look at what what it is in the rural areas the, the, i see lack of urban youth actually saying that forget what corruption is forget what the policy forget what the government is doing let me now handle something on my own i'll see for us the solution is the best form of protest for this young country i think we need to create more and more solutions and i think for example last time i had 300 applications for internships five indians wow. five indians so my question is to the young of the country was you also have a sense of responsibility that you need to show for the rest of the country and i, I think yes our generation is also for that we are not creating enough icons i think we need to we, we need to create solutions i think i that's why i find a lot of the younger rural youth coming up and we need to create that ecosystem for the younger youth of the rural areas to actually be that employers of the future that will change this country and will change and i'm very hopeful uh, about this thank you very much i'm i'm i, I think i'm required to sum everything up but i'm not going to do it because it's just not going to be possible for me to do it this one thank you very much all uh, uh, all five of you terrific terrific discussion thank you for 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 taking part uh, uh thank you very much thank you